Well, it's great to be here and thank you for inviting me back. It's always encouraging to get a return invitation, isn't it? But I've, before I start, I just wanted to say, I hope that's the prayer of your heart, that God would open your spiritual eyes and spiritual ears, because we have a God who sees you, a God who wants to be seen, a God who hears us, and a God who wants to be heard by us. And I just wanted to say how excited I was, I'm surprised you didn't come out in celebrations, to hear that God has answered your prayer for a successor to your wonderful previous pastor, Roger Fratwell, who was an exceptional pastor. He was here for over 17 years, a hard act to follow. But I understand that you've made a very important decision this week in taking on board Glyn, who I don't know very well, but taking Jack Curtis as well, who I know really well. And I just want to encourage you, he's an amazing guy, really uh, excited about coming to serve as part of the team here, part of the family. And uh, I'm excited for him and for you to, as you enter the next phase. I guess there's things to be sorted out before that gets going. But I just wanted to, to say how excited I was and pleased and encourage you to say thank you to God for hearing your prayers. One of the meanings of the Hebrew name Samuel is God has heard. Know that that is true. And Samuel is a very significant character in the story of the people of God. From his wonderful birth to Han in response to Hannah's heartfelt cry to the Lord for a son, right at the outset of this book of 1 Samuel, through his call as a child in the temple, speak, Lord, your servant hears. And throughout his adult life, Samuel becomes firmly established as a strong and godly leader. And last week, Stephen Gillam reminded us that, uh, that Samuel grew to be a man of prayer, a respected prophet, an anointed priest and a wise judge, among his other key roles and outstanding attributes. And although Samuel's death is still some way off, it's not recorded until chapter 25 and your series continues, today we come to that reading that uh, Graham read for us, thank you, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 8. I had a, a fright when you gave me a, a sheet and it said 1 Samuel 9 on the front this morning and I thought, oh, it could be a different sermon than you're expecting. <laughs> but uh, in this, the beginning of this uh, Chapter Samuel's described as being old, probably about 65 to 70, so it's all relative, isn't it? And it leads to big developments with regard to the people of Israel. There's a distinct change of tack here involving succession planning in the history of God's people. It's, some, it's a somewhat pivotal chapter in that respect. Because after at least 20 years had passed since the victorious battle at Mizpah, referenced in the previous chapter which led to the establishing of that memorial stone, Ebenezer, which Stephen mentioned last week. Ebenezer, thus far, so far has the Lord helped us. And I was reminded that that great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor, is said to have had a plaque wherever he lived, which had Ebenezer, Jehovah Jireh. Looking back, thus far as the Lord helped us, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. And we'd all do well, if not to put a physical plaque up, to actually recognise that God has given us strength to this point. But he's never failed us, and he won't start now, as we sang earlier, unless we can look forward with confidence. But here the Israelites were happy with Samuel as their leader, rather like our own queen, who I understand today has become the second most the longest reigning monarch of all time, overtaking the king of, of China from years ago, of, of Thailand from years ago. But this, this guy had, had been very faithful, like she had, and consistent before both God and the people. But Samuel was, as I said, getting on a bit. They, they didn't pull any punches, do they, when they say, you are old, <laughs> Ooh, right. and your, your, your sons uh, aren't much cop. They led the people who lived in the south of the land based in Beersheba. Joel and Abijah, sadly, were not good leaders. They wanted to get rich rather than make 
fair decisions. It didn't help the people, didn't respect the law, and didn't honour God. Remember earlier when Samuel was a child and God pointed out to him that Eli the priest had two sons who both went against his godly rule by living a wicked life. The result was that the nation of Israel itself became wicked. And now Samuel also has two sons who are living contrary to his own way of life, embracing wickedness. Understandably, perhaps, the leaders of that day would have been worried that the nation would slip into wickedness again. And when I was doing this, I suddenly thought, oh dear, I've got two sons, <laughs> Ben and Holly. And so's Jack. <laughs> He's got uh, uh, Elias and Jed, Jedediah. So it's not inevitable that, they will, that they'll go off the rails, but they need your prayers. We need your prayers. All parents need your prayers. And fathers next week will need your prayers. <laughs> Don't leave it just to Father's Day. Anyway, the upshot was the leaders asked Samuel for a king. I think they might have panicked, actually, but go, by going against the established way. There's nothing wrong with changing things, but you've got to do it according to the Lord's. You know, they, they had God-ordained specific ways. They were separate from the surrounding nations. But as you know, they repeatedly slipped away from the Lord, refusing God as their king. And just a word of warning as to church, I don't want to equate kings with pastors, but there are some, a few similarities. And, um, you know, sometimes people reject, reject a king. They were, in fact, rejecting God. Sometimes you reject what the pastor says. You're actually kicking against what God is trying to say. So don't do that with Glyn and Jack when they take responsibility here. Never forget this moment when God has, has led you together point joined you together. It doesn't mean you're, you're there welded together for forever and a day, but it means that if the situation changes, you need to sit down and talk and pray together as to what God's plan is. Otherwise, worldly thinking is asking for trouble. Praise God for his grace, which brings good even out of man's evil. In our own church, uh, I say ours because I'm in the same church as Jack, uh, at Weymouth Baptist. We've just finished an in-depth study on the life of Joseph, where a key verse is Genesis 50:20 that makes exactly this point. When Joseph finally and tearfully reveals his true identity to the brothers who so wickedly did away with him over 20 years previously, Joseph forgives them with kind and reassuring words. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. In other words, it was redeemed by the Lord, incorporated into his perfect plan. My own pastor calls this the, the family secret. God does not make evil happen. He doesn't rejoice. He rejoices in the truth, and so should we. But we're in a sinful world. We're in a sinful place. And our God is so great, he can even take evil and turn it for his good. Be encouraged in your own life and within a church with the various situations that you will inevitably encounter as you move on in the purposes of God here, you will come up against opposition, spiritual opposition, maybe even physical opposition. Praise God we haven't got the, the persecution that we were hearing of earlier, um, but who knows what the future holds. Much of life is undeniably messy when viewed in isolation, but as they say, history is his story. Seen from above, a whole different perspective is shown. God is weaving a beautiful pattern. That old illustration remains true, that to look at the back of a piece of embroidery is to see nothing but a tangled mess of threads. Turning over, however, and the seemingly random mess is revealed as a beautiful tapestry. Remember the nation of Israel beginning with the promise to Abraham and through, his, through Jacob, through the, the 12 tribes, uh, over 400 years, they went to live in, in Egypt, of course. Over 400 years later, the Israelites left Egypt in the Exodus. 
In the first chapter of Numbers, all the men over 20 were counted, and there were more than 600,000. Most of them probably had wife and, and children, and there may have been around 2 million. But it's the point. God's own timing fulfilled his promise. And when the Israelites left Egypt, God chose Moses. He started with words of Moses, and God chose him as the leader. When he died, God chose Joshua to succeed, and then came the judges and their leaders, always guiding, strengthening, directing godly men and at least one woman, Deborah, to oversee what was in effect a tribal federation. But during all this time, God was the people's king. He ruled over them. But now the Israelites rather insistently demand a human king. Nothing wrong with having a, a monarchy. As I said, we ourselves have benefited uh, slightly different there, but we still have that head of state. And God himself had said in his early promises to Abraham that kings would arise from him. It was his plan. But verse 20 of today's reading tells us the real reason why the Israelites wanted a king. They wanted a king to fight their enemies. They wanted one to lead them to war. You see, God had always fought for them when they went into battle. They always won when they trusted in him. An imperfect human cannot always make the right choices and certainly can't guarantee victory. And the Israelites often forgot God simply because they couldn't see him. They were prone to walk by sight and not by faith. In Hebrews 11.6, we're told the exact opposite. We're told to walk. Uh, no, we're not. We're told that, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's 2 Corinthians 5.7. My next point is that says we walk by faith and not by sight. Difficult to do. It requires a daily renewing of our, of our faith. Who is in control of our lives? You've been considering over some time. Well, we're asking for trouble if we refuse to look to anyone but God to be in control of our life. And I believe the key phrase in our reading is in verse 5 and repeated again in that verse 20, that most surely... Excuse me. Most clearly shows, not surely clothes. It's clearly showed this idea of peer pressure. A telling phrase in the NIV and in most other translations that are looked at says, like all the other nations, the people of God were fed up being distinct, being different. They were bored. They were jealous. They were restless. They wanted to be like the others. And as a Christian, do you sometimes feel the same? Perhaps the pressures are particularly hard when you're young, but we're all, te we're all tempted by that, aren't we? To follow the crowd, to be like everyone else, instead of going against the flow. And being a holy man, Samuel is not at all happy about this determined step away from God's rule. And he does the right thing. He takes the problem to the Lord. It's always a good move to pray when there are challenges. And rather surprisingly, perhaps, God says to listen to the people and give them what they want. But this is important. He says to tell them what they're letting themselves in for. Give them a warning up front. And he's very clear in this passage of the pitfalls which inevitably lie ahead. It's hard as a parent, isn't it, to try and encourage your children to walk the right way, to give them the facts, to provide clear guidance and godly wisdom, but then to let them make their own choices, even their own mistakes. And yet that's what God does with us, with freedom. That's what Samuel's encouraged to do in front of the people. But he does point out that the king would take and the king will make. He will take a lot for himself and he will make great demands upon them. Talk about cost of living crisis. These people were struggling at the best of times. Instead of serving the people, they are warned the king would take, 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 and eventually make the people virtually slaves. 
Samuel knew this, the people knew this, but they ignored the advice. And how often we can do the same. It was not, they said, no, we're not going to change our mind. And God gave them what they were asked for, but they would have to suffer the consequences. And there's a principle there, even for us as believers. There are consequences to our actions. God doesn't condone sin. Yes, his forgiveness is always available, full and free. But that doesn't mean that uh, God is unconcerned with our sinning. Sometimes we can, and what's it Paul said? Should I keep sinning because I keep getting forgiven? God forbid. Anyway, the people are then told to go home and wait for this king, and we know him to be Saul in due course, and eventually David. And so the grand story unfolds. God is working his purposes out as age succeeds to age. And I like the way the Bible commentator Bill Arnold puts it when he says, Israel's request for a king here was wrong on at least three counts. It was sinful in its motives, selfish in its timing, and cowardly in its spirit. But being like uh, Stephen Gillam and like in alliteration with his seven steps to, to revival last week, all the hours, well, I would change cowardly to spineless. The demand for a king was certainly sinful in its motives, just like Adam and Eve back in the garden, the Israelites of Samuel's day attempt to cross over the divine boundaries in order to become something they weren't meant to be. As Adam and Eve wanted to become like God, so the people wanted to be like the other nations. And similar to the first family in the Garden of Paradise, Israel was a divinely created community. All her needs were met. Her borders were secure. God was enough. But the people wanted more. And don't we do the same? Sometimes we can sing that Jesus is all that we need. But our lives belie that truth. But hey, they're... they're um, were sinful in their motives, but it was selfish in the timing because, as I said, God wasn't ever against the eventual establishment of a monarchy. The problem was that they wanted one now, in their timing. They were selfishly driven to settle for something less than God's best. His choice in his timing, even after Samuel's clear warnings. And we must wait too for God's perfect timing. It's always better to await God's will than force the issue and insist upon our own time scale. Let's always remember that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Think of the incarnation and Jesus coming to this world. You'd think you've been in a real hurry, but Jesus came at just the right time. Conception, development, birth, growth. That time, those years before his ministry began, leading to his salvation work on the cross and his glorious resurrection. And we know that Jesus had previously resisted a temptation to act outside of his father's will, outside of his perfect timing. And he repeatedly said, my hour has not yet come. He surely knew that saying now can be as bad as saying no to God. Impatience is a form of rebellion and as such is sinful. Saying now can be as bad as saying no. So it was sinful in its motive, selfish in its timing, and spineless in its spirit. You see, Israel suffered a lot during the periods of the judges, very up and down, with instability, with the neighbours threatening them constantly, and then being oppressed. But they were, in reality, their own worst enemies, repeatedly turning away from the one true God to worship false deities. And God had graciously used judges to save his people from their enemies and from themselves. Their unique situation demanded courage, faith in an unseen God. And likewise today, Christians are so often tempted to challenge the lordship of Jesus, taking the easy way out, trusting in worldly ways, rather than exercising courageous faith in a trustworthy father. Now, having given a bit of context to Israel's desire to be like all the nations, I should just briefly consider this whole idea of peer pressure. And one of the best uh, definitions I came across was 
the peer pressure is the temptation to take a certain action, adopt particular values, or otherwise conform in order to be accepted by others. I like this definition because peer pressure is described as a temptation. And as such, it's a pressure, but it may be resisted. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is possible. You see, negative peer pressure doesn't have to win the day. We can hold fast to our values and morals and even uh, seek out positive peer pressure. But peer pressure can be very persuasive. And Chuck Swindle tells uh, a story about the power of peer, peer pressure and the sometimes fatal desire to be like everyone else. Once upon a time, a spider built a beautiful web in an old house. He kept it clean and shiny so that flies would be attracted to it. The minute he got a customer, he'd clean up so that other flies would not get suspicious. And then one day, this particular fly came buzzing by the clean spider's web. And the spider called out, come and visit, come and have a seat. The fly said, oh, no way, I can see no other flies in your house, and there's no way I'm going in alone. But then the fly saw on the floor below a large crowd of flies moving around on a brown piece of paper. He was delighted. He wasn't afraid. He, uh, lots of flies were doing it, so he came in for a landing. But just before he did, a bee zoomed by saying, don't land there, that's fly paper. The fly simply shouted back, don't be silly. There's a big crowd there. Everyone's dancing. That many flies can't be wrong. Well, you can guess what happened. Sadly, that fly is no more. Now, some of us want to be with the in crowd so badly, we end up in a sticky mess, which tragically can prove fatal, spiritually deadly. For what does it profit a fly or a person if they escape the web only to end up in the sticky goo? <laughs> Don't crave being in with the in crowd so much that it destroys you. The pastor and youth evangelist Chip Kendall uses this idea of peer pressure being as being in with the in crowd. Of course, uh, peer pressure, as I said, could be good or bad. And how we respond can be good or bad. And there are many examples in the Bible of both. And I'm thinking of, of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and, and then Peter in the New Testament, the Gospels, having trouble standing up for Jesus. You know, that pressure is very real, always has been. Um, but... Any Anglicans here will, will know that it's Trinity Sunday today, and it seems appropriate just to divide the thoughts into threes, quickly sharing Chip's three negative ins, followed by three much more positive ins. Well, firstly, there are influences. We must be especially aware of the negative influences which, which can so easily sway us. Ungodly relationships, sinful temptations, unhealthy media. And just like those Israelites were influenced to abandon their trust in God, we too can be pressured to give an in to the godless spirit of the age with its secular, humanist and atheist agenda. There are so many negative influences around. You don't need me to list them. But no wonder Proverbs 4 says, don't take the path of the wicked. Don't follow those who do evil. Stay away from that path. And the Apostle Paul could say, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. The antidote to negative influences. Always the word of God. If there are so many influences to be aware of, there is also intimidation the devil seeks to bombard us with stuff that will drag us down. Abuse, bullying, and loneliness are just three that came to mind. But cheer up, for as it says in Thessalonians, God will do what is right. He will punish those who cause you trouble and will bring you relief. Apparently, the New Testament word often translated as intimidated is a word used of horses in battle that get spooked and that bolt and stampede away. And sometimes we, in the face of intimidation, can get scared and turn and run. 
And Paul, in particular, frequently says, don't give in to that. Stand in the strength that God supplies. I was going to say about the armour of God, but you, you know the armour of God. Let's move on. There are, again, an antidote to intimidation is to be prepared, defend ourselves, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. Influences, intimidation. The third end to fight against is insecurity. Some of us are, are prone to this, um, speaking uh, personally. Um, there are unhelpful comparisons with others, trying to impress them, and over-dependence upon what others think, causing us to take our eyes from God and his view. Romans 12, 2 says, don't change yourself to be like the people of this world, but let God change you inside with a new way of thinking. Let God define you. Allow him to change you. Remind me of an old song. It must be 50 years old. I won't attempt to sing it. You'll be pleased to know. You probably don't know it, uh, but some of these words lodged in my brain and they came to mind. It, it, it was from Chris Spracklin and said, What's it like living in this new society? Is it really any better now than it used to be? Do we really think we've made the right choice? Do you think we've got it right? When men prefer the darkness to the light, what we seem to need is a change from the inside out. Could it be that Jesus really knew what he was talking about? We need to replace insecurity with a sense of security in Jesus. It matters what he thinks, not what others think. If influences, intimidation, and insecurity are negative ends, the three more positive ones are individuality, independence, and involvement. You see, God knows and loves you. You are special to him. You are precious to him. Do not doubt that. God loves you so much, he sent Jesus. So if anyone tells you you're worthless or you won't amount to anything, or you're, you're done, and you're no use, you're a burden, or if you feel that, just look at the cross. That's how much God loves you. Viewing yourself through his eyes, we are fearfully and wonderfully made by him. As Max Lucado famously says, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Face it, friend, God is crazy about you. You're unique, a one-off, both a masterpiece and a work in progress at the same time. And this individuality leads to an awareness of our independence, that freedom that comes from being in Christ. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Speaking to a large audience, the great preacher D.L. Moody held up an empty glass and asked, how can I get the air out of this glass? And the crowd was stumped, and after various wrong answers, Moody smiled. He picked up a jug of water and filled the glass. Then he said, the air is now removed. and went on to explain that the Christian life is not a matter of attempting to remove a few sins here and there, but by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost Sunday may have been last week, but scripture urges us to be filled and go on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Individuality, independence, and finally involvement. I recently received an advertising text uh, which caught my eye from the co-op actually. It, it said, the more you get involved, the more you can win. I'm not trying to plug that particular company, but I'll nick this strap line of theirs and apply it to the church. The more you get involved, the more you're going to get out of it, the more you're going to profit, the more you can win, if you want to use those worldly terms. You see, peer pressure works both ways. Getting in with the right crowd, those who will believe in you, those who will build you up, those who will help you grow in Christ, is so important. Seeking fellowship with others, learning to spur one another on in faith and godliness. And Robert, you cyclists know all about spurring one another on. 600 miles, 400 to go. You, you need, we need one another. And here's another three quick spiritual life lessons we can learn from cycling to end with. 
and relevant, I think. Balance is everything. You can't get far without mastering balance. You fall, and it hurts. Likewise, we need spiritual balance to progress in our lives. Again, it's famously been said, if we have all the word, we dry up. If we have all Holy Spirit, we blow up. And instead of that, we need to have word and spirit and grow up in him. Balance is everything. And there are hills ahead. Obstacles scattered throughout our lives. You've, got, you've been through a few, a few more. I don't know if anybody saw the uh, On Your Bike uh, soccer aid last night. I caught a little bit of it. And it's a, like a, sponsor, a celebrities doing a, a cycle challenge. And, uh, and one of them, bizarrely, put up a prayer. And his prayer was, Oh Lord, may there be no, uh, no hills in this next stage. And if there are any hills, may they only be gentle ones. And may there be more downhill hill, hills than uphill. And the, and the other person said, oh, I don't, that's one prayer that isn't going to be answered then. And I thought, oh, this is a good sermon illustration here, because doesn't Jesus say something about moving mountains? Uh, but hey, there are hills ahead. You know that. We're not promised a, a, a smooth, level ride through life. But conquering a few obstacles builds our spiritual muscles and better equips us to tackle the next. Balance is everything. There are hills ahead and accidents happen. They're going to happen. Don't forget that cycle helmet of salvation. You know, maybe not all the rest of the armour. That might weigh you down a bit more. But you do need that to protect yourself. And bring, perhaps bring some flour. I expect you've got first aid kits and all sorts out there. You've got to be prepared, haven't you, for what is, it lie, may lie ahead. And, and the same in our Christian lives. You know, we can be prepared and we can, we can anticipate issues. We can avoid a lot of problems. You can't... Uh, another tragic thing was the TT races, wasn't it? Five lives lost over the last week on that... that uh, thing where they're driving and they said that we can't get rid of all the risks but we can get rid we can mitigate them we can can get rid of unnecessary risks and I thought again I should have written that down as a proper quote shouldn't I but it's there's some parts of the Christian life that we can't avoid but there are some things we can minimize and we can put not put ourselves in place uh, where there will be temptations and where there will be pressures the best way to keep from giving into peer pressure is look to the lord father son and spirit and i close with a version of an old fable highlighting one of the key perils of peer pressure an older man was traveling with a boy and a donkey and as they walked through a village the man was leading the donkey and the boy was walking behind and townspeople said the old man's a fool for not riding so to please them he climbed up on the animal's back Well, they came to the next village, and people said the old man was cruel to let the child walk while he enjoyed the ride. So to please them, he got off and set the boy on the animal's back, continued on their way. In the third village, people accused the child of being lazy for making the old man walk, and the suggestion was made that they both ride. So to please them, the man climbed on and they all set off together. In the fourth village, the townspeople were indignant at the cruelty to the donkey because it was made to carry two people. That frustrated man was last seen staggering down the road with his carrying the donkey. (laughs) We can't please everybody, and if we try to, we end up carrying a heavy burden. When we give in to peer pressure, when we try and do everything others want us to do, we can become frustrated and confused. I was taught in this very church over half a century ago that to know true joy, you put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, as far as needs are concerned. And it's true, I was thinking about that today, that even as regards opinions, you know, if you put others' opinions first, you you lose joy, don't you? (laughs) Oi. No, no. But you've got to put Jesus' thoughts. So we sometimes say, live 
for an audience of one. We don't have to try to please everyone. We don't have to be like everyone else. We don't have to be liked by everyone else. We have to look to Jesus. Amen. Amen.